Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 259. Today we have Danielle Rose Bird in the house talking to Barry and me, talking about lots of stuff, green woodworking and the culture that comes with it, the tools that she's been using lately, sharpening those tools, how someone could find their own design voice, and lots of other stuff. We kind of have a blast, to be honest with you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Danielle is a green woodworker, carver, bowl carver, and author of a book, The Handcarved Bowl, on Blue Hills Press. And it's a phenomenal book, and I'll mention it in the show proper. But if you'd like a chance to win a copy of that book, head on over to the show notes and leave a comment, and that will enter you into a giveaway for one of Danielle's books. And if you don't win, y'all should go out and buy it because it's pretty great. Head on over to her website to do that. Quick note, I'm going to ask a favor of everyone. I'm going to post a link in the show notes and in the YouTube doobly-doo asking you to fill out a form. And the form is about finding denatured alcohol. Denatured alcohol, believe it or not, has been hard to come by for some people in some states. I want to know where it's been difficult to find and where you've been able to find it eventually if you have at all. And if it isn't difficult to find, I want to know that too. So do me a favor, click on the link below or in the show notes and fill it out. It's going to, it's like a four question thing at most. So it'll take you 30 seconds and it'll probably help a lot of people find denatured alcohol, which is something that most of us use in our day-to-day -day shop lives. All right, enough about that. Here is Shop Talk Live 259 with Danielle Rose Bird. Danielle Rose Bird. Hello. You are an author, an artist. You're many, many things. Multi um, yeah. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a green woodworker? Yes, at times. Okay. Like, like there was like, cause you, you, you've used a power carver, haven't oh. you? Okay. Oh, and that frequently? I, I more so now than I used to. Um, really? And on Greenwood, which is like pretty much blasphemous. And yeah, Barry's expression right now. Because yeah. I would figure that the cutters would gum up. Like, I'm surprised it works. And well, I, here's the thing that I, bad. I'm, I actually don't, there's particular ones that work better. Because yes, oh. they do gum up because like the fibers are so soft. Um, so it depends on what kind of wood, what kind of like um, area you're looking to excavate. Uh -huh. The power chisel, just you can just go to town. The yeah. power chisel. I want to. What kind of power chisel do you have? Armor, Armatech. Okay. Bigger. It's bigger than like the Automac and uh, Fordham. You know, those ones are kind of like little. Fordham easy. makes a power chisel. I think so. Ooh. I've never tried it, and this is just for me, like visual memory, seeing yeah. like colors. Um, but that's more like a size of like duck decoys and figurative, small figurative carving. Oh, okay. So sculpturally, I'm sure I'm using it beyond what it was intended. Right for. on. Because usually, they almost everything I've ever seen in an Arbor Tech video is them showing like someone. Uh, taking out the waste for like a hinge mortise. And I'm like, I would never use that in that context. And I've never seen someone use um, their larger gouges. Like they have like a set of five and the largest one is pretty, pretty big. Probably like a, if I'm thinking about the file system, probably somewhere yeah. around the 20 millimeter across. Oh, wow. And like a, like an 11, it's like a huge. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I'm just right. allowing. <laughs> okay, so just describe a power chisel. So a power chisel is basically a reciprocating tool. Um, and it has its own sort of motor, its own built-in mechanism. It only engages and starts to reciprocate when you put pressure on it. So really? it's not just what? doing that on its own. You're not no, no. putting it in air and it's like going to town. It doesn't happen until you actually put pressure and uh, then, and then it's like the equivalent of hitting a gouge with a chisel. But I'll like a jack. Hitting yeah. a gouge with a chisel. 
Hey, woodworker guy. Yeah. Hitting, a, <laughs> hitting a, a gouge with, with a mallet. Yeah. It is like a little mini jackhammer. Like, you kind of feel that powerful. To get out. Yeah, it's amazing. Huh. It's amazing. And I started using that when I started having tendon issues. Of course, prolonged periods, you know, bring up other issues of vibration and numbness and um, carpal tunnel, but so does not everything else, really. Yeah. So, yeah, this is definitely something I want to talk to you about because, all right, I've got your book. And for the record, I have two copies Ooh. because uh, your I'm publisher greedy. sent one to me because I'm famous. And, um, <laughs> but, I was actually laughing at your well-placed joke, not saying that it wasn't really good. Um, but, and then I also bought one because I love everything you do. And so we're going to give one away because I don't need two, right? So, um, if you want to, uh, if you want a chance to win Danielle's book, leave a comment on the show notes page. YouTube doesn't count. I might make fun of you if you use, if you leave the comment on the YouTube page. Um, but leave it on the show notes page and just say like, hey, that's a great book. I really want it or something. And uh, then I will take the comment number and put it into an Excel spreadsheet and pick a winner and send it out to you. But all right. So I, I get your book. I'm oohed and awed by the pictures. The pictures are great. Thank you. The drawings, Maddie Hinckley's drawings, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, they did a great job. Yeah, um, that was like a whole other thing. I wasn't really, I've never worked in that way before. And we had started working together before, you know, all of this started before the pandemic hit. And when I first got in touch with them, it was like, how are we doing? Yes. And I'm just so analog sometimes that my brain was like, I go for like the most direct method. And I was like, <laughs> making it so hard on myself of like taking photos and then writing about these descriptive things. And they were like, how about you just take a video? And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I just, like, <laughs> I have no idea what, what block was there. But as soon as they suggested it, I was like, oh yeah. And, um, and then we were off for the races, but they did a fantastic job and I was just so delighted that they even wanted to be on board with it mm -hmm. um, because I love their work. It's sculptural. It's, you know, they, they studied at the Krenov school. So right. they know woodworking. So it was like that, that hump. I didn't have to like, it, it takes so much to um, convey those really core concepts to people that don't understand it. So to have an illustrator that was also a woodworker, it's like incredible. Yeah. Incredible. yeah you, you're not explaining what a, what a bevel is. Mm -hmm. But yeah. then also having, you know, I did have to explain everything from like the base level so that they could understand where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. And then it was great because then they could be like, but I think this would be better. Okay. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. Or just being like, illustratively, this doesn't really make sense. And I'm yeah. like, yeah. Um, so it was a lot of funny videos. <laughs> of us being like, and I have like all these little weird props, you know, I'm holding it up and I'm like, so, you know, not like this, but like this. Like, <laughs> a lot of like twirling things around and being like that, that is, I'm sorry, scratch that. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, because you're having this 3d item in your hand and you're trying to think of it in a 2d flat way that they uh -huh. can, can made 3d and I can't draw lick, like cannot do it. I, Envy the woodworkers who can, uh, you know, the Peak Alberts, the Dave Fishers, the Maddie Hinckley's. I'm like, how? If I could just draw that. Mm -mm. Well, so I had something, I had to do an exploded drawing for a, a project outside of, of work. And I thought, okay, I've got this modeled in SketchUp. Just move the parts away from each other. And that's, that's it. And it quickly became apparent that there's an art to like illustration. How to illustration is not necessarily about drawing skills. It's not necessarily, it's about like getting the angle right in order to show the thing to, in order to, you know, exploded drawings too. I couldn't figure out what angle to show. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there like hovering around in SketchUp and it's just like, it doesn't make any sense. I called Dave Richards. I was like, hey, let me give you money to do this. I can't do this. <laughs> you know what was uh, clay yet again. So what I would do is I would create like the object thing and clay. And then I would literally take a wire and slice it. Oh, sweet. And then be like, oh, so that's what you're going to see. Not that part. Okay. Oh. oh. Yeah. So that's where like, I have to do things like really analog and like really straightforward or else my brain, because I think in 3D. But I, yeah. there's, some, there's like a hang up between like going to 2D to 3D. I'm like, that? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God, my brain was just smudged, smudged. Um, but I'm so happy to hear that those like concepts were conveyed visually in the book because they were really tough. They were really tough. It's, it's hard to take a... a, a a linear process, but that has a lot of conditions. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like well, very conditional along the way. You're like, well, you do this unless it gets like this. And then uh, unless this happens and you know, there's like so many factors. It's like, how do you do that in a, in a way that is static? It's in a book. So I'm not going to explain anything later, but how to like organize it in a way that makes sense, but also considers all of those conditions or at least most of them. Well, and, and you just said it like it is laid out in a linear fashion, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think too few books these days are linear. They're more conceptual or whatever. And, and this is like, but it's hard because you don't necessarily know the log that they have when they're carving a bowl, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, but yeah, really just really, takes you through every step of the process concisely. The visuals are fantastic. The thing that stopped me dead in my tracks, and I'm not the only one. I think I've talked to Nancy about this. I think I've talked to Chris Bexford about this. The self-care chapter. It is the one I've heard the most about. Get out. Without a doubt. Like it's three, a four, slap like, in the face. It is I've like never seen it anywhere else. Like yeah. It's so obvious though, when you see it to like, why are, why are woodworking uh, are us included? Why are we not including this? Or why are we not talking about this more? Yeah, and tool maintenance. I mean, it is literal tool maintenance. Like, and maybe it's just amplified by the fact that if I feel like a lot of green woodworkers are, are coming to terms with the fact that I've been beating the crap out of my body for years now, and it's starting to come back at me. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think you were the first one that, that had mentioned that one time where it was like, you know, I'm not doing spoons right now because it's just too much wear and tear or, or something, you know? Um, so the self care chapter of the book is just phenomenal. And my wife's read it, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of like really good stretches in there. A lot of, um, you know, every so often I do this and blah, blah, blah. It, it's kudos props. Thank you. Thank you. And at some points I was like, am I, am I, is this too simplified? Like, I know this, but I've been doing it for so long. At what point does it become like, of course people know this. And then I was like, that's the point I want to get to. Cause I feel like with instruction in general and in woodworking circles, what tends to happen is we skip over that. There's like a lot of this assumed knowledge base that happens. And then, and then, people get kind of lost along the way somewhere. And so I feel like the self care chapter sort of um, in a really fitting way reminded me throughout the book to be like, no, 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 no. Simplified, oversimplified is, is good because so many people are fearful of asking those questions. And then you brought this up earlier when we were talking, you know, prepping for the podcast of like the <laughs> brave way to ask those questions, you know? <laughs> 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 Sorry, we need to repeat that for those who didn't listen. <laughs> Danielle was telling a story about somebody who asked how to eat pizza while watching a movie one time. So. Yeah, and I, I and I believe that I actually like show like pretended I was holding a piece of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I wasn't mocking them. You're, <laughs> you're practicing for your book. Yeah, then years later, I didn't even know. It was you know really- what, though? I bet you those people turn out to be great woodworkers one day because they asked the questions. 
<laughs> the ones that everyone was afraid to ask, you know? And, and, and I love that. And when I teach in person, um, I mean, also when I teach virtually, but I've had more experience teaching in person. Um, I tell people, I say, I want you to ask all those things you, you've been afraid to, because I also feel like in a lot of learning realms, there's like a big shame base. Yeah. I'm not so down with that. Um, I think it's all well and fun to like rib people and make jokes and, and that has to do with like rapport too. And, yeah. other person. and I think um, I've seen it happen a lot in woodworking where there's like, that's like, there's like low level vibration of shame happening of like, Oh, come on, bro. I can't believe you asked that. And it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. And those are the questions I love to ask because I know if one person is asking it, there's at least four or five other people in the room who never would have, and it's going to help them get to the more advanced stuff. Yep. And I... it was all because of a math teacher I had in high school who was like, I mean, like fervent, like frothing about this, where he would be like, it is never the advanced stuff. It is always the quote unquote easy stuff that people float over and then they're trying to grasp it. And something just isn't clicking. And it's never the more complicated stuff. It's always the basic rudimentary things that they feel like they should know. So they go with the flow, figuring they'll figure it out as they go. It never happens. It never clicks. And then all the advanced things seem really complicated when it isn't about the advanced stuff itself. It's it's all the things that they miss and they thought that they were just absorbed magically. Um, so I always try to, to like really address those those rudimentary concepts and the things that sort of can get played off as like, I can't believe you don't have that yet. Um, and I try to do that with the book. Yeah. And that's why I like, like the repetition too um, with each project. So I have three projects in the book and I realized I wasn't going to get away with not repeating anything because yeah. you kind of have to. Um, but then I realized framing it and showing like how basic concepts apply to different shapes and different design elements um, and how it, how it affects different projects in that way was the value in, in sort of repeating those things, like really basic concepts and how you hold the tool or, or something um, would, would be conveyed in each new project. Hmm. So, all right. So let's bring it all back because self-care tools, carving, all that stuff. Do you think that along with not being able to ask or being afraid to ask the stupid question or what seems like the stupid question, do you think that there's, um, there's too many woodworkers who like, for instance, I recently started carving spoons again. I've carved a couple spoons. I haven't, I didn't carve in a, in a year or two probably. And I decided, you know what? I don't like axe work. I just don't like doing it. Yeah, bandsaw to the rescue. I got a bandsaw <laughs> right there and I just did. And I was like, so much more fun. This is so much more fun. And I felt like there was something like back in the day when I was carving a lot, there was like this mental block. Oh, you have to carve. You have to rough out your blanks with a hatchet. Cause if you don't, you're just not a green woodworker. Or, or you're not this, or you're not that. And um, that was a big step for me. Just, But that's the other side of shame culture. That's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so do, do you find that in, in classrooms or where, uh, where when you bring up a power chisel or a power carver, people are aghast? Only in green woodworking circles. I think that there's a deep self-righteousness within green woodworking that I do not enjoy. Um, and that only came about, and I, and I realized for the same way that you did, where I was like, this is so much easier. Why am I like, and I was having health issues. Like I was like in physical pain and was still trying to sort of figure out a way to do it in this right way. And in like the true um, sort of traditional um, like earned, like the sense of yeah. like you earned it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when I started doing, you know, other things like using the bandsaw or using power covers, and I was like, this is so much easier. I'm not in pain. 
And it was like that light bulb moment of being like, wow, that, that was so easy. Um, why am I doing this again? And then <laughs> you're, it's punishment. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's a self punishment there. Um, and I'm not saying that there isn't space for preservation of traditional techniques or, or just a, an appreciation for, um, for all the tools that you could use. But I think, um, and this, this is also true on a much broader sense of creating hierarchies of what is right and what is wrong. Um, also is where power imbalances come into play. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you can create a staunch grid for what is right and what is wrong, you can take, you can, you can have power within that circle. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like if there isn't any nuance and isn't any understanding that there's value in doing a lot of things in a lot of different ways, it neutralizes that power and people are afraid of that. I find that to be true, not just in woodworking, obviously, in a lot of other spaces. Um, But in woodworking, it is extremely pervasive. And I find that that's why when you say, here's a power carver and it worked really well for me, you're not just saying, here's a power carver, you're blowing up their entire spot. And they don't know that. I I feel like they haven't had to look at anything any more than just like, that's what's right. We've declared it's right. We've declared it's the best and I can do it. And that makes me feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also inherently allows them to make other people feel less than, and I'm just not okay with that. Yeah. Um, and I realized how much I was participating in that. I didn't want to. So I was like, yeah, have that. Do whatever you gotta do. <laughs> We're all here. We're just trying to make it work. Make some pretty stuff that works like, you know it's like it's like both taking things so seriously and like appreciating it and loving it and studying it and understanding who came before you and then also being like but it's beautiful like who cares i want that to be your next book pretty stuff that works and (laughs) where the chapters can be blowing up their spots i think that we're putting together an outline no no wait you're putting together an outline right now i don't know if you intend to but i'm down for it Hold on, let me just, this is not a joke. I have this little notepad. It's fine we're working notepad for when I do <laughs> I have a pen. Let's just start this. Lesson. So um I know I know in my life, um I am a fairly judgmental and by nature negative person. And with that comes, you know, what I do is right, what everyone else does is wrong, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I've, I have been trying to do that whole thing of, I, I don't know what the quote is. It's somebody smarter than me, but it was like, amplify what you love. Stop hating on what you, or stop dissing what you hate or whatever. Mm-hmm. Somebody in the comments, come on engagement. Um, but, uh, for me, that's what kind of led me to the bandsaw. It was like, just, I want to, I want to sit in front of the fireplace and carve, facets on a spoon more and if i do it if i rough out on the bandsaw i could do two of those like in 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 two days and if i do it with the axe i can't and it was just like focus on the parts of woodworking that you love and get through the other part and you know like mike always says he he loves the look of dovetails he doesn't necessarily like cutting them so that's why he does dovetails on the table saw you know focus on what you love Mm -hmm. and that's it so Yeah, All right. I agree. And I could say that I'm also a judgmental and negative person, even though that may surprise people. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> well, you're twirling the cable. <laughs> I, like, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> uh, but I think that's why I can't, that's why I've, I've, I've thought about this so much. It's like, well, what part am I playing in this? You know, like, what yeah. am I going to, constructs what is the the thought process happening in my head because that's where it all starts is me and what i put out into the world and so if this is how i'm thinking about let's let's you know i want to be real with myself like why do i keep thinking like this what is the cycle and and i think 
people are like, wow, this is like big concept stuff. I'm like, yes, but it plays into absolutely everything you do. So we're just talking about woodworking right now. We're just talking about hand tools, but it is affected by things. And I think at base level, you say it's, you know, it's pretty easy to be dismissive and say, it's just a hand tool. It's just a bowl and it's just a spoon. But that's where all the little things grow. And I would argue that all of the little things when allowed to become bigger, become much bigger issues. And so they're much more um, approachable as those smaller things because the same dynamics exist in the spoon as they do on like, you know, federal government level. <laughs> to me, I go that big. I go this that is, big. This they is officially stuff. the deepest shop talk live ever. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> The I'm correlation like, between wooden out. spoons and federal government. Yeah. Thank saying, you. <laughs> power dynamics, they're there. It's the same. It is the same stuff. I had to swear silently so that Ben and Barry could see me, but. That was, I actually thought Zoom cut out right there. Yeah, me too. I, yeah. yeah. Oh, That's, I'm. Okay. Multi-talented. Millie Vanilli level. Yeah. <laughs> that multi-hyphenate? Millie Vanilli. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It, let's... It's the same stuff. It's like the same dynamics that are at, in the small levels and they're being, when, when allowed to get past all those different spheres, the woodworking world, the arts and crafts world, the design world, when you let it, when you let it grow, it will, and it will become something much, much bigger. So I think it's, it is important to delve into it at the very small levels. Yeah. Take it. Woo. Woo. All right. Let's answer some questions. Let's, let's get deep with these two. All right. Uh, this first one is from Brandon. Um, every year I look at doing a special project with my courses that is different from your stereotypical high school wood shop class. I've done shaker boxes and even completely switched up and bring and brought my forge and anvil in to have students try their hand at blacksmithing their own marking knives. In the future, I was thinking about taking a slab or a stab at letting them try spoon carving. Uh, how to how to spoon carve is not what I'm asking, but somewhere I had heard concern for using nut bearing wood, such as walnut and cutting boards because of potential food allergies. While I'd like to say I have immediate access to a class worth of cherry billets, being from Missouri, my access to black walnut and hickory are far more plentiful. So when making wood projects related to eating, uh, spoons, bowls, cutting boards, etc., is there concern for the species to use as it relates to possible nut allergies? I've never heard of anything from the wood itself. I've heard people be cautious with walnut oil. For, okay. You know, and I've also heard um, of people who make the walnut oil addressing the protein that people react to. But to me, as a person who struggles with allergies, I just don't mess with any of it. Mm -hmm. I don't struggle with walnut or nut allergies, but knowing what it's like to deal with them, um, I just, I don't mess with the oils, but the wood I've never considered because that to me is easier for people to avoid. You know, if you say, Hey, it's, this is walnut wood. If, if you have an allergy, beware, but if it's all you've got and also dealing with like a school environment where yeah, I'm not right. free is taken, you know, very, very seriously for obvious reasons. Um, I don't know. And where I don't know, I err on the side of caution. Yeah. Especially with nut allergies. It's not the same as other ones where it is like zero to a mm hundred -hmm. and you're, it, it gets very, not good like very, very quickly. Well, another consideration too would be if I were going into, um, presenting spoon carving to a, a, a beginner audience, Walnut's not real fun to carve. Ooh. Neither is hickory. A hickory, I'm sure. Hickory. I mean, that's that's hard. Like like. Oh, I just wish that birch was just available everywhere. I you know that's the thing. It's like I've heard people like walnut. I don't think I've ever carved it once. Actually, we don't really get it up here. 
Um, but if it's all you have, yeah. Ew. And like the other option is hickory. Hickory sounds like death to carve. <laughs> it, um, for a spoon. Now it's like, yeah. that's like, and, and try to like minimize hand carving. But if you're trying to teach about hand carving, um, I would honestly, I'd say call up Dawson. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> oh, okay. Dawson Moore, Michigan Sloyd on Instagram. And be like, can you just like make me this many for this? Yeah. Time? Yeah. And then boom, easy peasy. It, yeah. If Dawson can do it. I don't know if he can. I'm not like. Well, he's, he's he, like at the moment, I think he's doing a run of spoon blanks, you know? I saw them um, coming out, but I just didn't know if he was doing like special orders. So I didn't want to. Oh, offer. I don't know. I didn't want to like, you know, insinuate that that's what he was. Offering. But there are people out there who supply spoon blanks, you know, and yes. everything that I've seen seems very reasonably priced um, yeah. for, for the amount of effort that goes into them and shipping. And um, yeah, so I, I, that's a, that's a good take on it. So see if you can get some birch from yeah. someone. And birch Dawson, is just I, so fun to carve too. And because what Dawson is doing, he's prepping everything to such a degree. I mean, he's just Mr. Precision, you know, and like consideration of material. Um, and if you're doing it in a school setting, you know, the attention span of, you know, young carvers and someone getting into it for the first time, I think what he's offering is absolutely the best. Right. Yeah. You're not going to get some wacky billet yeah. that a kid has to deal with or that you have to deal with prior to the kid. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's getting it to the, the fun part, you yeah. know? Well, and, and Dawson's the, your bandsaw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like the, you know, he's, he's weeding out the bad grain, Yeah, you know? Um, yeah. That's a really good point. Um, I haven't heard personally, I haven't heard anything, uh, that would scare me off about using a walnut spoon. If I were allergic to nuts, tree nuts, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like, especially if you're dealing with green wood, that the, the resin or, or whatever, the, the moisture in there, you're, you're really knee deep in it at that point. So I, I don't know if, if I would, if I would do it, I think I'm, I'm with you. I would err on, on the side of caution. Um, one thing that I do tell people is, uh, Siri Robinson. That's what I was going to suggest. Everybody's stealing my answers. <laughs> Take it back. I know I'm here. <laughs> Take it. And I'm working with Sari. <laughs> Sari, thank you. Yeah. Take it. Oh, so Sari Robinson is a professor at, I'm forgetting, a university in Oregon. And she's written a book, Living with Wood. She's, sorry, professor of wood anatomy. Um, so I'm thinking exactly like Bruce Hoadley. And she wrote yeah. a book, Living with Wood, and it is like dealing with woods and in which ways they can cause reactions. Whoa. So it might be like, this is, um, this is an issue when you're sanding, but it's okay for, and I'm making stuff up. Like I'm not talking about walnut. Like yeah. this is okay for, this is a problem in sanding. It's okay for a cutting board or it's okay with a chisel, you know, like not fine dust. Yeah. This is okay for a cutting board. Don't use it for a cooking spoon because it'll be like in the pot of pasta sauce where the hot water will leach out whatever the extract is so this is another gap that i've always wondered i've never heard anything about like a like a one-stop shop for this specific issue and how do you spell the s-e-r-i seri and then the letter c like canada and Ooh. then robinson okay um and she's so i have not read the book we just started working on an article together but she's really good about like not just saying oak, bad, pine, good, but like, <laughs> this is where it's fine. Maybe yeah. be careful here. Like really nuanced. I'm going to say the nuance. It's never, love it. Love it already. Love it. Well, they blew my mind one time with a, um, an email exchange saying that basically almost all woods have been analyzed and identified and blah, except like box elder. They're like, we just haven't gotten a box elder yet. And the red on box elder uh, is something that I would stay away from for edible, uh, for, for food items, just because we don't know yet. I just, I can't tell you it's good yet. And it was <laughs> I love like scientists. I love it. 
Whoa. Okay. Good to yeah. know. I, you know, yeah. like would have never thought of that. Okay, cool. I also cool. am a big fan of the, I don't know, like genuinely. Right. Yeah. Just to say you don't know. Right. Like, just say you don't know. That's helpful too. Yeah. Okay. All right. And going back to Walnut in a school environment, like you said, like if you don't know, yeah. inside a caution, like a tw- 30 year old buying a spoon at a, like, at a farmer's market, I trust you to know whether or not Walnut bothers you. But like yeah. a kid, yeah, that's yeah. kind of frightening. Yeah. Sorry, Brandon. The other kid who doesn't even know who is in their next class with them. And like, the oh, whole, true. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. stuff can get, it's, they're so, people can be so sensitive. Like, open a bag of peanut M&Ms on a plane and someone 15 aisles back is like, yep. <sighs> my, m- my nephew, I, <laughs> Barry laughs at this all the time, but my nephew for 10 years was so allergic to everything that he could only eat just about, he'd have a plate of bacon and potato chips. Those are like the only two things. (laughs) My favorite story about him though, and he has a much more severe food reaction than I do, or like food limitations, was he would get like safe versions for himself. So I have celiac. So I have like gluten-free beer which I'm assuming is trash to anybody who can drink normal beer, but I don't want to know. I don't want anybody to tell me that it is not perfect craft artisanal beer. <laughs> and then, like, wouldn't your nephew go and be like, oh, try this pie that I made? And people go, oh, it's so good. And I like, kind of <laughs> gag it down. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Uh, it is true though. I'm also a person who, who deals with food stuff and, uh, <laughs> and my versions it's it's same to you, Barry. I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm also the person though who's I love having the things around that I can't have, which I find is not necessarily true for other people. Really? Yeah. I walk down the bread aisle and I like I pick it up to ten miles an hour. Like I do not even want to huff in this air. That's yeah, but that's not not for like um, safety thing. It's more of like because I can understand how you're like this isn't probably safe for me. I it's don't just anxiety that. inducing. <laughs> okay. Well, I can understand that too. That's for me in um, scented things, chemical oh. bombs. I can't do it. I can't do the laundry aisle. It sends me into like a fog. Yeah. Um, but I want all the tasty things that I can't eat. I want people to let me smell them. I want them to tell me how it tastes. I want people to tell me how it tastes. Yeah. Tell me everything. And then I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay. What, what is, what, oh my God, delicious. <laughs> I can remember. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm the guy who eats all the stuff and tells people <laughs> how it tastes. I would be like, bring the donuts. Bring the donuts. <laughs> all right, let's, let's, let's take a quick break. At Peters Valley School of Craft, their in-person workshops are back. Workshop registration is now open and they're looking forward to seeing you in 2022. Come focus, explore, and create at their immersive craft school in the Delaware Water Gap. One class that looks super interesting to me is Make and Weave a Shaker Stool, taught by Ellie Richards. Ellie in the Woods on Instagram, basically my new favorite Instagram account. Head on over to petersvalley.org to learn more or call 973-948-5200. This next question is from Chris. This is a small question. <laughs> Danielle's not going to get deep on you with, with this one, Chris. No, <laughs> I've been woodworking for a few years now, and most of my projects have been based on existing plans, both big and small. At Christmas, I decided to make a mallet. I discovered that while I had ideas for the design, I would yet to establish a signature style of my own. Green and green is a definite style. Jimi Hendrix had his own playing style. How does one find their own woodworking style or look? Danielle? I I think, and what I think is counterintuitive, is to let yourself be very, very bad. Allow yourself. Give yourself the latitude to be incredibly bad at what you're doing. That's how you find it. I think it's like, once because I think people go into that and they just want to know they want to settle in that space so very quickly and it will never happen like that I don't think 
And I think that if you go into it being like, this is going to go very badly, but not in like a horrible, like, oh my, this is going to be so bad. But more of like, this is just going to be bad. Like, <laughs> cool. like, let's just do this because that's the inevitable. It's, it's going to be bad at first. Like trying to find your way in the yeah. Like it's never good. You're never going to like find the beacon like instantly. It's not going to, it's not going to. And to me, if you do, I question whether it's not what you really, what you're really looking for, you know? So I think just understanding it will be bad. Things will go wrong. And then once you've like really absorbed yourself and, and dissolved the fear of that happening, everything else becomes so much more clear because you're not just avoiding something, you're going towards something. All right, so then I have a question. Wait, were you done? Yeah. So do you recommend like jumping in with both feet? Like this table is going to have seven legs, two are going to be on the top and <laughs> it's, you know, like, and, like, do you re- like, do you recommend like just failing <laughs> epically or like, I'm going to mix green and green with mid-century modern with like a stone and light, like really disparate elements. Just put two legs on the top. That's all or, yeah. or, it's like, or like, or like, I'm going to do green and green, but in maple and purple heart. Like, I'm just going to make some tweaks. You know what I mean? Like, are they little tweaks or is it like, we're doing this? Well, I think that everyone, I think part of like, letting it be bad is that people want to also force the bad. Like if I do all of the bad in one project, (laughs) I'll I'll just get that face. And I'm like, that's what I'm saying. You gotta like, you gotta like sit in it. You gotta like sit in it and anticipate. It's not like, it's not something you're trying to get over. Like, and as soon as you hit that spot, you realize you're kind of in, you're, you're finding your, your place already, like inherently by not trying to like get over it or get it out of the way. But I think it's a really good point that, I mean, who hasn't done that of like, cool, I'm going to do everything. And you just put everything in one, go for it. I say go yeah. for it. But I also think that, you know, <laughs> saving material perhaps would be wise at that stage. Like maybe get a chocolate play or like sketch up or if you're good at drawing, Maybe get like this the two leg on top idea out on paper. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, I don't know, Barry. I say you go for it. Right, so like so fail at the mock-up <laughs> stage or like at the sketching stage. Yeah. Not at like the dovetailed and tenon stage. Although I I also think that that's where like the beauty of innovation lies is like outlandish, the things that people told you you could not do. I mean, we've all seen the uplifting, you know, film. It's like everyone told me I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know and so it's like and i believe there's truth to that you know where it's like all the things that people tell you isn't possible it, it might not be exactly how you envisioned like all of it may not work out but this one joint that you didn't think would actually be stable is you know and you're like well okay all right and then you take that little nugget and you go to the next thing and then you take that little nugget and you go to the next thing and you build and that's the excitement part like that's like where you start building your style is that you realize what will work within the context of what you're trying to do and then all of a sudden you're like oh i have this this thing and now i see this pattern of what i'm doing sort of naturally like what i'm gravitating towards i think that's how you build style now how is how is that working in your current work Cause you're like, you, you, you've gone really, really sculptural. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you planning these projects? Are you just kind of like, some of them look like, like so organic that I would think your cat inspired things like these stances, like, like a bowl that looks like it's (laughs) like, it's relaxing or, you know, you're about to turn this into a cat podcast unknowingly, Ben. Oh, (laughs) It takes every fiber of my being not to. <laughs> um, I, I do some play models, but okay. beyond, beyond that, I just kind of go for it. All right. That's um, what I thought. I'm, I also think that I'm able to do that because I'm one of my skill sets. Even I think everything I can't do in terms of 2D and drawing, I can do visually in my head. Like mm. I get that skill. I can turn objects around. I can understand oh, nice. head really, really well. Um, 
And so sometimes people will like, I'll be checked out for a very long time because I'm just figuring out the whole thing in my head and throwing out everything that doesn't work. Like I don't need paper to do that. Um, I couldn't do it on paper if I tried. So I kind of just go for it. Um, and I also go slowly enough and I learn enough along the way of like, when, when is the point of destruction? Like when yeah. the point of no return and better at identifying it before it gets there. So I can at least hold off and be like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen with that. And sometimes it's actually the smallest. I tend to do more models within the project itself. Like if I don't know how to work a uh, transition, like with all those legs and everything, sometimes I'm like, I don't know how that's going to come over the side. Like the newest bowl I did with like all the sort of that kind of like honeycomb esque one with like the the flat not the flat legs but um well it's why it's it's sort of spacey space age looking um I don't think it's on my website that one I wasn't sure how I was going to like transition things and instead of I got to a certain point when I was working and I was like I don't know what I'm going to do here so then I started doing smaller versions or doing it in clay and cutting it out and then realizing what actually translated to the tools I had oh, um, cool. and what the tools could do. And if I needed to switch tools or if it was even possible with any of the tools, cause then there's grain considerations and the clay doesn't behave the same as wood, obviously. And so sometimes it's just me staring at a chunk of clay for like 45 minutes and being like, I don't know. Can we elaborate a little bit on that process? Cause I've never heard of a woodworker messing with clay to do, you know, it's always like foam core and hot melt glue or whatever. What kind of clay are you using? Like, and again, most of what you're doing is very not flat work. Um, mm -hmm. So sculptural bowls and sculptures and, and, and just, you know, cause some of, some of what you do is non-functional art, right? Mm -hmm. um, some, of, some it's, of it is definitely like in that gray area. Yeah. Like how much, what, how does it function? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But so, so how do you actually go about, like, are you using Play-Doh or is it? It's like modeling a clay? sculpture clay. Like the, what is it called? A uh, plasticine, plastic, plus. Okay. Plastic something. Um, I use that. And so it's like a medium hard clay where it can hold shape really well. It's not going to soften as, as um, much as something like Play-Doh would, like in terms of like putting it down and rolling it, or, you know, it takes a little bit of force to get it to shape. Um, and I find that sometimes I don't know what the problem area is until I actually start attacking the piece. That's why I don't do it beforehand. Okay. If I do it beforehand, I have an idea. I keep like notes on my phone of ideas that pop into my head if I'm like out and about. And I'll just draw it with my finger and then be like, oh, right, that thing. And I have a much better vision of it in my head. And then I'll just start working. And then usually the problems don't come up until that stage. Because I can't identify. It's so unknown mm -hmm. that I can't really identify where all of the problems are all at once. So I work until there's a problem. And then I work it out. And then I work until there's a problem. And then I work it out. Like, mm -hmm. It can be stepped like that for me. Um, and then other times, like that most recent one I'm talking about, answered a lot of questions I had, and I was able to replicate it in other things quite easily because I had already sort of figured out all of the grain issues. Like I said, with clay, you can carve it from any direction and do anything with it. But then you have to sort of then solve the problem of, can a tool do this? Can mm -hmm. a tool actually fit into the space? What tool? What direction? And now what direction is the grain going? Will I be able to accomplish that? Is it like with the legs, those little creature legs? Am I going to be able to do that when it's such a steep angle? And how much control am I going to mm -hmm. have? Mm -hmm. And sometimes like with those first creature bowls, I have no idea. I just had to do it. Um, so and it's like, you know, you put 40 hours into a piece and then you're like, could this blow up right now? Yeah. <laughs> but like having the ability to like walk away and take a break when you need to, that's 
key to your process. Oh, their skill set. I'm telling you, it's and, like strength. But I would think that that only comes from getting reps, like having it crash and burn frequently, until you learn. Okay, this is where I. This is where I should have stopped. Yeah. Is is that? And I I think that comes back to Chris's thing. It's like I don't know how you how you create something new and original without creating a lot of things first and getting the reps in. Right. And then also letting yourself go past the point too. I feel like a lot of people, they don't want to mess up. So they'll like hold themselves back. And I'm like full throttle, full throttle. And then you can look back and be like, yeah, that was the point. Cause you're never going to know the edge until you go over it. Uh huh. You know? But I agree that it's like a lot of reps. And then sometimes I feel like people also, it's, again, that I feel like there's like a lot of that shame stuff of like, oh, this was so bad. I'm done with this. I have to like burn it or it has to go away. And sometimes that's the case. And other times I just keep chewing at it. Like I just keep going. I just keep going. I recycle, 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 recycle. Um, and then it's like, I have to compartmentalize it sometimes so much that it allows me to keep working on a piece because sometimes your emotions take over and you say, I'm just so disappointed with how this went. I just spent 40 hours on this thing and this is not it. That's why I have multiple products. I put it to the side. There's also like a, a really big emotional component of and exactly. And I'm so glad you brought this up. It's such a skill to know when to stop and to be like, I am getting in my own way. That one's going to the side. I'm not going to play nice with it right now. I'm definitely going to take out all of my, Oh, and insecurities and anger on this thing. And it doesn't deserve it. You know, like it doesn't deserve it. And I'll start on another project. Something I, something that's certain. It's like, what do I need right now? I need certainty. I need to know that I'm still good at what I'm doing. I have some traction here. Okay. I'm going to go do and start another project where I know that's what it's expecting me. This is what's going to happen when I do the thing. And then I come back to the other thing later. And I have much more clarity about like, I can compartmentalize, like I was saying, and say like, okay, so the feet weren't working let's just forget about all the rest of it. What part isn't working? Or like a crack showed up. All right, get rid of the crack. Sometimes it's just as easy to be like, like when you were like, oh, um, my hands hurt. I'm doing all this axe work. I love being by the fire. It's warm. I'm just gonna go to Banza. Like it's just going towards the things that work. And I think people don't realize how many stops there are along the process. Even with the work I'm putting out right now, we're, I'm sure maybe 40% of the time of what I'm doing. And then the other 60, I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's what people don't understand. It's like, how are you producing this stuff? And it's like, oh, it's because I don't know. I don't know what's happening. And they just assume that I do all the time. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I have no idea. So if you look back at your I don't know, the last five years, do you see an arc to your work? Like, oh, I was doing this and then this happened. Or like, you see where like you took colors and then you're doing facets and then at some point you're doing colors and facets. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I, it happens a lot with, um, with grant writing and applying for funding and you have to like, you know, summarize what you've been doing and then it makes you reflect on that. And then also you have to, you have to, um, submit photos. And so I have all these, you know, categorized photos and you look through and you're like, that was three years ago. Like, (laughs) and you feel like you have been on a journey, like (laughs) everywhere. And you're like, wow, that was only three years ago or five years ago, six years ago. Um, And there is an arc and there is, you know, so many influences of like who I've met and the kind of other work I've been doing that has influenced that. Um, I, I just feel like there's, there's always opportunity for influence like that. And it's a lot, like, like Ben said, a lot of reps. And, and the reps could be in any format, like ideas that you talk about with other people, little notes that I write to myself in my phone, um, the little, you know, uh, models that I have in clay, um, the things that ended up not working out, that you're just sitting, all the stuff I've burned in my fireplace. I burned, I burned a whole batch of spoons the other day. It yes. great. Sometimes you just gotta burn them. You're like, you know what? Actually, I don't. I'm, I'm good with this. I just wanted to heat something, you know? Yeah. 
<laughs> it needs to it needs to become fuel. Yeah, that's its function now. <laughs> yeah. Um so have you made anything flat in a while? I remember you saying that you wanted to make like a bookcase at some point just to like still on my list, Ben. Still on You have a full you have a table saw. People would never think that. I don't anymore. I sold it. Oh, okay. It scares me. It was, and it, it wasn't like a healthy fear. It was just like, I wasn't using it. it just, okay. And also it wasn't like the best table saw ever. Like safety features that needed to be there that weren't there. Yeah. Um, but then I realized I was like, is this thing really doing anything for me? Could I just get a track saw somewhere down the line? Yeah. yeah. So I sold it. And then I just built another workbench where it was. So okay, nice. Yeah. But I do want to make flat work. Um, I have, I do have the tools for it. I have most of the knowledge for it and could, if I applied myself (laughs) in that way, could, could easily build the furniture that my house and really the storage that my house so desperately needs. There's just books all over the place. (laughs) It's a good look. I know. It makes me look smart. I haven't read any of them. (laughs) All right. This one's from Matt. I've recently changed my sharpening process on my chisels. I would like to know if you think it is a bad idea. I'm sure other people do this, but I've never seen it heard or discussed. I haven't been able to think of a reason not to do it other than it might take slightly longer to grind my primary bevel once it is necessary. I start with my primary bevel at 25 degrees. Then I hone a secondary at 30 degrees. Once the secondary bevel becomes too large, Uh, To realize the benefit of having a secondary bevel, I then sharpen to a 35 degree tertiary bevel. I will stick, I will stick with this until it becomes, until it becomes too time consuming to get sharp and then repeat the process. So Danielle, not many people know this about you, but you used to travel with Lee Nielsen and teach sharpening. I did. And you get, you get stuff blisteringly sharp. So yeah. I saw a lot of people do the finger test and then whip their hand behind the back. <laughs> and slyly deliver them a Band-Aid without mm. calling attention to anything. Yeah. Um, or bother with a, third, with a tertiary. I wouldn't do it. To me, I would go the straight... As soon as, like, the point where you want to do a tertiary, I just go back and chase back the primary and then do more frequent chasing of the primary before I would do the tertiary. I understand where you're coming from with the tertiary if, like, you just have one more thing you need to do or... But I wouldn't really incorporate that into my everyday routine. And also, I, I've i never... It's never taken me an hour and a half to get... That's a long time. That was one thing yeah. that surprised me. And what do you say, regardless of what method I use, it normally takes me around one to one and a half hours to reestablish the primary? Yeah, so like, I didn't I long. didn't I didn't read that way. Uh he's doing it on a slow speed white grinder, coarse DMT grits, and 180 grit paper on granite. And See, that's the problem. 180, I go right to 80 and yeah. do one uh, and just <laughs> plop the <it up. laughs> mm-hmm. So you don't need to have who cares about the grain like the the striations on yeah, a it just needs to be there we're touching anything you just want to get the material and if you're doing it you can go down to 80 if you're doing it by hand unless you are an absolute unit you're never going to create the heat that's going to you know you know <laughs> take the temperature <laughs> of <grain>. like <laughs> unless you're dead or, He's sure has done it. Listen, listen, Barry takes offense to that because he's a unit. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, so, 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 all right. One thing we might have glossed over right there. You're never taking that primary bevel back to the edge then. Because mm-hmm. you just said Chasing. it doesn't matter how deep, like, like I'll use 80 grit or whatever. Because it, so you, you're not going to bring that all the way back to the edge. And I think that's what a lot of people might be doing is they, they go back to their to their uh, coarse uh, diamond plates or whatever and go all the way back to the edge, and then they have to hone those grinding marks away. And here's the thing is I think that then becomes 
just a cosmetic thing that they're worried about. And I understand there are a lot of engineers who do woodworking. They don't <laughs> want this thing to look like precision. And you have to, at some point, like, what are the, it's the point of diminishing returns. You know, like, does it function? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Yeah. Are you putting in less work? And then you compound that by however many times you're doing this and resharpening. And it's like, it's a no brainer to me of like, I would never put the tertiary in. And then I would just go, go to chasing back that primary bevel, not all the way to the edge. You're just chasing. Let's say you never go to the, the tertiary at 35. You stay at your secondary at 30. You're just chasing it until you come right at the bottom of the line of the secondary, not to the edge to the bottom of where that is, and then readdress the secondary. Yeah. And I guess I just had a realization that probably matters, you know, whether he's, he's talking about plane blades, chisels, or whatever, but um, a 35-degree bevel is not very, is, would be difficult to plane with. Right? Yeah. Um, but not would not be good for pairing with a chisel. Mm -hmm. It'd be good um, for softer woods, low angle stuff. With for tear out considerations, but it'd be difficult on a bevel up. I'm sorry. Thanks. All right. Yeah. I was yeah. like, wait a sec. Okay. And there's so many. Yeah. Here yeah. That there's, there's so many con considerations. Another question that I have is how often are you ch sharpening? That's what I mean. I'm like, I think Matt, at some point you might need to look into your processes you might be like doing too much waste removal with your chisels or yeah. you might be doing too much. Like I haven't ground my primary bevels on my chisels in like years, two or three years, probably. Yeah. yeah. I avoid it. I avoid yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it takes me an hour and a half. Me never, but maybe. It's so, so what, what is, you uh you have a grinder is like just a regular eight inch grinder right yeah but i've never used it like that i usually okay. use it for how are, what is what is your process danielle um so i'm typically doing gouges so i have an entirely different thing i yeah. do if i were to use chisels i just have a thousand grit stone and uh, a 310 combo okay. and I do it all by hand. I don't have a grinder. Um, and then honing I also guide, have a honing guide. I have a honing guide. I have a Lee Nielsen honing guide. And then um, I have um, a float glass with, you know, whatever I need paper. I have like a sticky backed 80 grit mm -hmm. and I hardly ever use it ever. I can't remember the last time I put that down in my float glass because I never I'm hardly ever chasing back that that primary bevel, but I also don't do a lot of case work, so I'm not using those flat chisels a lot. Um, with, with with your gouges and and knives, are you still using? You were using that. Um, it was that film, like that plastic backed film from Lee Valley or something. It was uh, um, 3M, the three M micro abrasives. Oh, okay, yeah. that's still what I use. Um, and that's a, that's like a whole, I don't know if you want me to get into that. That's like a whole other ball game. Sure. Why not? Come on. It's, I mean, obviously similar concepts, but, um, I, I think it's also important to just do like consistency and not waiting until you get to the absolute point where you have to do something about it, even though that's yeah. really tempting. And I've all, obviously we've all been there. Yeah. Um, it's just upkeep, you know, it's just maintenance. It's like doing the thing where you have before you really have to do the thing. And if you have the setup, ready for it. I think that makes it a lot easier to just like go over, get it done. It's much more approachable. Um, I just keep, I hardly ever, ever, ever readdress my gouges. And that's what I'm using all the time. And I'm saying readdress is in go back to a really, you know, um, coarse grit. I 98% of the time I'm just using a straw hmm. with compound on it. And that is it. If I'm also really meticulous about how I place my tools on my table, how many mm -hmm. tools are on my table, if any of them have the potential to roll into something else. And then that also sort of negates ever having to, to worry about taking nicks out of them or having to do coursework 
that's how much I hate going back and doing it. Yeah. You know, like if you have to fix that many things on a course level, at some point you start getting really good at taking care of your tools because you just mm. don't deal with it anymore. You know, it's like, it's just, it's such a little thing. And then you're like, oh, this is going to take me. Especially gouges. Like, oh, <laughs> it's brutal. And then, and that's also what you're doing, using for finish work. So it's like, you know, I'm going to see that track mark on every single little divot. <laughs> oh yeah. That's a really good point. Cause like what you're doing, that is, that finishes right off the chisel yeah. or the gouge or, or the, the edge. Yeah. And so, so if you have a Nick, your finished piece has, it's like leaving planar tracks in, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, exactly. And so it's like, you get really, really um, diligent about how to take care of the tools because you get one little, and I usually don't ever notice that I've done it. That's how minor it can be. Because if you think about it, it's such a fine point that hitting it against something is like so much pressure against that tiny mm -hmm. high point. Um, and so it doesn't take much to do that. And something that looks really tiny can look really massive to the eye when you see wood. Um, it definitely looks blown up in proportion. Um, and then you're like, where is it? And you're like looking for it on the, on the edge. And you're like, is it that thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you get, you know, you get educated very, very quickly and like how little it takes to get to that point. And so you start taking care of your tools, like as a carver anyway. Um, I think chisels, when you're doing rough work like that, there's a little more leeway. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. The honing guide makes it like, ah, crap, it's dinged. I'll just, you know, take the time. Takes the stress out. And uh, yeah, for, for chisels and plain irons, the repeatability of a honing guide just. I love I've, it. I've gone yeah. through phases with them, without them, blah, blah, blah. And I honestly, the tool that I can recommend the most probably out of everything I have is that Lee Nielsen honing guide. And the Great. biggest recommendation that I can make about it is the fact that I got it and I stopped worrying about sharpening. Mm -hmm. I like got it and I haven't really thought about sharpening yeah. that much since. And like it, my stones are fine now. It was, I was blaming everything else uh -huh. except, except me or except, you know, like, yeah. and it took the me out of the equation. So it's very true. And to, it's so funny because I, for a long time, I had to be like, if I just drunk too much of the Kool-Aid, like the Lee Nielsen Kool-Aid, like I was working for them. I had to like, seriously question, like, am I just like saying this because I've seen it over and over and over again. It's been my experience. So I've internalized it. Or is this really true? And I was like working through it on my own. I was like, no, this actually just really works. Yeah, it's um, really good. And like such simplified concepts, like the stop blocks, like, you know, they're a little, mm -hmm. little plan for it on their website, which they used to of just like measuring how far you have to project your blade out and using a stop block to do that for certain degrees. It's brilliant. Um, and it does, it takes the human component out, which sometimes doesn't need to be there. And sharpening is, is kind of one of them. Um, and with, yeah, plain blades and chisels, absolutely every single time I'm using the Lily Nielsen honing guide. Yeah. If it fits in there, I'll use it. <clears throat> yeah. <sighs> All right, if it doesn't well, fit in, I'm returning it. That's <laughs> yeah, last last one you you yeah, no. yeah. so jaws for this. I need it for this three and a half inch chisel. <laughs> spoke <laughs> shapes. Spoke shapes are like the downfall of of me and that honing guide. I can't I can't bring myself to get the extra jaws. So I gotta freehand all my spoke shaves. Wait, no, you can fit your spoke shaves in there. Not my well, not the one I use most. The uh wait, are you talking about the bogs? What are you what are you using? Uh, well, I, I have a box and, um, or you have old Stanley, the, the, the Caleb, uh, oh, see, I'm, I don't, uh, yeah. I'm blanking on the last name, James, Caleb, Caleb James. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. But it's a big, thick blade. It's not hard to freehand that one, you know, but I like it to fit in that thing. But, all right. Well, Danielle, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, anybody listening, leave a comment. On the show notes page on findwoodworking.com or shoptalklive.com. And I will, that'll enter you into getting uh, one of Danielle's books, The Hand Carved Bowl. Where else can you get it if you don't win by leaving a comment? You can get it on my website. Yeah. Preferably place to get it. It's the best way to financially support the work that I put into it. Um, 
You can also get it on bluehillspress.com, which is the publisher of the book. Um, those are the two best places, most direct ways to to support it. Cool. Perfect. Well, thank you for being on, and uh, we will talk to you again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Head on over to Danielle Rose Bird, B-Y-R-D.com. Also head on over to the show notes page at shoptalklive.com and sign up for your chance to win Danielle's book. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, please send them into shoptalkaton.com. I've said it before, please sign up for the Fine Woodworking e-letter at finewoodworking.com slash newsletter best way to be apprised of what we're doing here at findwoodworking.com. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thank you so much for listening. People go on vacation and they just act a little funny. Like I worked at a pizza place and they're like, how do we eat pizza and watch a movie at the same time?